Everybody is good. Good. All the time. God is good once again. All the time. All the time. Yeah, we thank God again for the classes we are having and the lessons we are learning. Uh, the Endless studies of courtship. Uh, like I shared with you, the reason is uh, uh, most of the time we make it look like it's that the central issue, to get the point. But there are other key things that uh, need to occupy the mind a lot. But again, we are also privy to the fact that where there is a multitude of counselors, there is what? There is safety. Can you call it? Where there is a watch, multitude of counselors, there is, there, is safety, there is safety. And that is the reason why you need to hear the counsel of God so that your mind is persuaded and actually you are able to see the point. I want us to pray so that we study. We are praying, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the class that we are having now as we share together. May your spirit guide us and give us understanding according to your riches in glory. For this we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now I shared with you the other day about the foundation of the family. And I remember we realized that the family is, is holy. Marriage is holy. And uh, meaning the process of courtship must also be holy. Amen. I don't know if I'm making sense. Marriage is what? Is holy. Just like the Sabbath. If marriage is holy like the Sabbath, then the process also of getting into it must be holy. And that is the reason why I shared with you that it is not about you and your wife or you and your girlfriend or the two of you. It's all about the glory of God. When you read the Bible in Hebrews 13 verse 4, the Bible portrays marriage as honorable above all things and the bed and defiled. But homongers and adulterers, God will do what? God will judge. Marriage is honorable. Above all, it is honorable. And the bed must be undefiled. And that is why we share that because of this, marriage should be entered into only by partners who share a common faith and a similar lifestyle. By the this is from Adventist Belief, page 329. Our SDA belief, the book we have as Seventh-day Adventists, has that quote that marriage should be entered into only between partners who share a common faith and a similar lifestyle. Now, when I was sharing this the other day, I talked to you about the fact that marriage in itself was, an, was started by God. And we learned the other day that marriage became a significant issue when Adam was already established. Do you remember? Adam already was given a place. Adam was already given dominion. Adam already had the image of God. Eve was brought by his side so that the two of them may actually live out the image and character of God. I remember our sister Trizia talked about the objective of the longevity of man was that the longer he lived, the more he will do it. The longer he will reflect the image of God. We saw that man was made perfect. His mental, physical, and spiritual powers were well symmetrical, isn't it? Well balanced. The marriage was to be the place where the perpetuity of mankind was to be continued. Because we must not dismiss the idea that marriage was also for procreation. God wanted us to multiply and fill the earth and he wanted this to be done in an environment that was stable. And that is why I shared with you again and again, there is no marriage that can be valid before the two of you vow in the presence of God that you will remain committed to each other. That is why I kept telling you through the presentation we had yesterday that there can be no can we stay arrangement. There can be no engagement in sexual activities 
before that statement is made. That statement includes the aspect of commitment. Because marriage, for it to be holy, you must be consciously committed to each other. We together. And that is why we made it clear that it must be between two people. Number one, we talked of stability. The Garden of Eden was very stable. They were able to supply their daily needs so that both of them were capable of meeting the needs of their children in case they came by. And at the same time, they were able to live out a life of fulfillment and they were able to practice everything they believed. Now the interesting thing is, Eve was also brought to Adam already in the image of God. Amen. God did not bring Eve with a different image. And that is why we insist again, the partnership in marriage must be like that. Now I shared with you also another important point the other day. The needs of a man and the needs of a woman are different. Most of the time when we talk about courtship and marriage, a man must always reason in how he can fulfill the needs of the woman he will marry. And the woman must always reason in how she will fulfill the needs of the what? Of the man. And that is the basis behind which courtship operates. As long as there is mutuality, there is a common ground of faith and principles of lifestyle, the next thing is how can you meet? One of the things we constantly try to denounce is the idea that people are having today that men are women and women are men. You get the point? You know, Kitambo, we could not be confused about this thing. And now we are so confused. Because there are some men who want to be women. And there are some women who want to be men. And do you know you don't have to be LGBT to be, to be a woman when you are a man? And you don't have to be LGBT to be a man when you are a woman. Do you know that? You can really be a Seventh-day Adventist man who is a woman. That didn't go well with you, did it? <laughs> yeah, we say that the message will not be received. We will just speak it plainly. We are together. I must make it clear that the basis of marriage also is that you need to know the needs of each other. I shared with you the other day that the most significant need of every woman and known to her, the way God made the woman, especially after the fall, is security. And because this is the mega need of the woman, we realize the man must always be prepared, even as they are planning to look for a wife, they must have the mental idea that the happiness of their wives will depend on how much they can meet their security. And like I told you, because of posterity, because of the fact that we will have kids, women think on the long term. They think on how will my children be, how will we eat, how will we live. And that is why I shared with you that the largest burden of the man, before you think of settling down with a woman, you must think about your stability. The ability to provide. Because as much as it may seem insignificant, it is a very important aspect in settling down because the entire family will submit to you based on your sacrifice on their behalf. When you look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5 from verses 25, when you begin from verse 21, you find the Bible says, Why submit unto your what? Unto your husband as unto the Lord, isn't it? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. When you look at the relationship between the church and Jesus, what has Jesus done for the church? He has provided everything that is reasonably possible for the church to grow. He has offered his own life. He has paid the ransom. He has done everything. The same thing we must envision in the home 
The man must constantly be self-sacrificing to provide the needs of the family. That's why I'm repeating. One of the major things that should be able to establish that is stability. But we cannot neglect the woman. Sister Wright, I'm going to say women are not supposed to be just present there at home, not assisting and helping in the development of the family. In fact, they are to learn trades. They are to work alongside their husband. There is a place, she says, in Adventist home that the best partner for you as a man is a woman who stands shoulder to shoulder with you in spiritual things and almost in other areas. You get me? Shoulder to what? Shoulder to shoulder. So those are points that we illustrated yesterday. I don't want to dwell so much on them. But we also spoke about the fact that courtship is not different from dating. I want to lay these points now in terms of uh, principles that we must look at. And I'll be giving you Bible quotations that can actually assist us to be able to look and know them much more clearly. Now, I want us to do some case studies of two marriages in the Bible. And then we are going to look at now the objectives that you must do when you're making a choice. The things that you must actually categorize and have in mind. Now, there are two marriages in the Bible that I normally use as a case study when I'm teaching this subject. One is Samson and Delilah, or Delilah, whichever way, depending on your English. How, what can you say about the marriage between Samson and Delilah? Yeah? How can we call it? I call it an opposite attract marriage. Opposite what? Attract marriage. It is the same marriage of Nani, Ahab and Jezebel. Opposite attract marriage. Those are case studies of marriages where individuals did not share common faith, individuals did not share common lifestyle, but they only thought that because they loved each other, they came together and settled together. We need to understand that this is very important. The second case study we are going to be looking at is Isaac and his wife, Rebecca. We call it like attracts like marriage. Like attracts like marriage. So these are the two marriages that you will find in communities everywhere. And I must say that we have strong proponents of the Samson Delila marriage, even in the church. Some of them may even be here. But I can be a way more to the Ambadilisha. Mungu anangalia roho, mimi ni kutuna ee, hata anafanyangi vitumbaya, ni church tuwa endi. Si James kia kinishautia, ni vile tu simu adventista. And the devil says, I like people with that kind of attitude. So you find an SDA walking with a Rastafarian. You are in church, you are quoting someone who's never... Some of those things are very critical, but we will look at these two aspects. Now another thing that we need to understand is, this opposite attracts opposite marriages when you are marrying someone outside the faith, but I am glad that Sister White makes it even clearer. When you read uh, the book, uh, the letter, I want to read for you one example that she has given that makes this issue much more clear. Uh, this is... Uh, Review and Herald, 1952, page 63, she says, Never should God's people venture upon forbidden ground. Marriage between believers and unbelievers is forbidden by God. Review and Herald, 1952, 63, she says, Never should God's people venture upon forbidden ground. Marriage between believers and unbelievers is forbidden by God. Then she goes ahead and describes a believer is not just someone who is different from your faith, 
but someone who does not believe the present truth you believe. What do I mean by that? I mean someone who does not believe the things that you believe at this present moment. So we need to understand that it is, it is safe that Muslims marry what? Muslims. SDAs marry? SDAs. Catholics marry? Catholics. Jehovah Witnesses marry? Jehovah Witnesses. Because the Bible has taught us again and again that there is no way you can be able to marry these opposites and then have peace at home. And that is the reason why we are nurturing you to know that family life begins by the associations you have within your church, within your faith, within similar aspects of lifestyle and some of the things that we are talking about, that we are looking at, that we will share today. Mr. White makes this statement in Adventist Home, page 70, she says, Heaven looks with pleasure upon a marriage formed with an earnest desire to conform to the directions of the scriptures. Heaven looks with pleasure upon a marriage formed with an earnest desire to conform to the directions of the scriptures. So meaning God is looking with great desire to see unions that are formed with which basis? A desire to conform with the scriptures. That is something that is very key. So there are some choices that we must look at here in the choice of selecting a partner that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And I want to look at them biblically and very importantly. Now, what is the first principle that is very important when you are choosing a partner or when you are settling down with someone or you've reached an age where you see you're mature and you'd want to settle down? The first one we want to look at is the value of parental responsibility and support. I call it the value of parental responsibility and support. When you look at this issue deeply, there are many of us who in their relationships or in their lifestyle, they feel that parents are hindrances. And in fact, the only time they introduce their parents is when they are taking the dowry when they have a week or two weeks to the wedding, when everything has already been settled upon. But I want to tell you ideally, this, this principle is opposite biblical reasoning. One of the reasons why we have a lot of breakups and so many problems in the lives of young people is because they want to begin a relationship without their parents. And I'm very sure Parents will never allow you begin coaching when you are too young. If they even see that you are intending to do it, most likely they will they will they will they will gain the foolishness out of you if you're young. It's not proper to say in the hell out of you. You are not in hell yet. But <laughs> the foolishness that you exist and that is the reason why you find Godly parents will never permit you to have associations that tend to be so close with women or men when you are in primary school. They will want to know when you go out and when you do what? When you come in, whom you relate with and how you do. And I want to tell you, only parents who are lazy and careless will permit their children to engage in relationships that are useless, that destroy their lives. Parents should be very careful. Even in high school, as a parent, I would never allow my children to be in romantic projects. <laughs> I will not just teach it to them, but by example, I will help them understand that this is an area that requires maturity, and a young person barely out of their teens is a poor judge of even a partner that you want to spend the rest of your life with. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to do that at that age. And that is the reason why, in the Bible, Abraham guided Isaac in the book of Genesis 24, verse 3 to 4. You can go read that at your free time. Abraham told Eliezer that, Swear unto me that you will not get a son for my wife among the Canaanites among whom I dwell. He said, Make sure you go back to my home country. And he was particular about a family whose reputation he understood. If you are indeed the children of Abraham, then indeed you will follow Abraham's example. Isaac's marriage was not hidden from the parents. 
in fact it was initiated by the parents there was the guidance and the blessing of the parents I don't believe your parent can advise you to be in a, in a relationship in first year unless that parent is mad but they will not do that they will not allow you to end at this underhand courtship and they will be very careful in guiding you so we need to understand that there must be parental responsibility and support not at the end of the courtship but at the beginning you don't like what i'm saying i'm telling you the truth amen where should it begin at the beginning in fact you need to know that Hagar, Hagar guided Ishmael. Can someone read with me the book of Genesis 21 verse 21? Hagar actually guided Ishmael. Genesis 21, 21, if you find it, those who are having the mic there, you can read it so that I move fast. 21, 21. Uh -huh. uh, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. Uh -huh. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Uh -huh. Read again. Of, of Paran, uh -huh. and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now, who took him a wife? His mother. Did you know that even, even, even Rebecca had a good family support for her marriage? They didn't give her out until they approved. You can find that in Genesis 24, verse 50 to 60, at your free time. Sister White in Adventist Thomas said, "Parents should be consulted." at the beginning of courtship so anyone here who wants to do it god's way i'm not saying that you take your time bringing every lady to your family members what i'm saying is you need to understand that courtship is not trial and error by the time you are introducing them to your parents you have already done your homework and you have realized that the person you want to introduce is someone you are capable of spending the rest of your life with because you already know them the principle is choose the right person from the beginning amen it is not about about guesswork one thing i can tell you if you spend all your time here with the ladies who are here and the men who are here by the time you're getting to fourth year you know people pretty much isn't it you know people's belief systems the idea behind courtship courtship is not ideally friendship courtship is people you have known for a while you are now reached a moment where you are settling upon an individual that you already know and like i shared with you the other time you can never know someone when they know you are trying to know them i will never really be myself if i know if i know you are studying me if I know Kitur loves Bible studies, I will always be posting quotations in my wall. <laughs> if I know you like to sing, I will be in the choir. Isn't it? Yeah. If I know that you are a Seventh-day Adventist and I know I am not of this faith, I will come here and join just so that I get you. Courtship is not dating. We, we caught people we know and have already tested using all this time. That is why I told you parental involvement and responsibility is when you have already tested all these things and you think sister so and so is the one, brother so and so is the one, before you make a step to involve them, you need to involve family. And let me tell you, if you've been a good child to your family and your parents, your parents are not there to mislead you. Are we together? We are not saying that you come formally, but you can discuss with your father or your mother that there's, there's this lady or there's, there's this man that I have looked at and I'm thinking this way. Can, and maybe can I invite him home so that you see him? Or, or you, And your parents can have ways of looking at things and they can tell you we think you are infatuated. This is trouble you are bringing to your parents. <laughs> and we must not always look at it negatively. You know, there are some people who always think their parents are against them. So anything they say, you look at it as, as lack of wisdom. Your parents can see things you can't see. <laughs> you know, right now, I can tell you for sure, the taste of ladies I would have had in first year is very different from how I see women today. 
You get me? I'm not just looking at a woman in the sense of being nice. You know, like when we've been here to Mewa, to Meoshua Mikono, we're being served by your Do you get the point? They are nice ladies and they are doing something nice, but marriage is beyond that. Marriage is beyond washing hands and being served. Are we together? Did you come, Nanipata? Yeah. There is nothing against the deaconry department. We love your work. <laughs> You've been blessed by it. And we intend to be blessed further through this week. Amen? Amen? Yeah, we don't desire that you stop. But we are saying courtship is beyond niceness. The character must be evaluated. And that is why I said friendships are always better when later in you now know someone, you approach them when your mind is already convicted. I told you the other day, one of the problems we are having today is unnecessary coating of attention before you are actually able to settle on someone. And so we have situationships. You did not have time to evaluate, but already you are, you are crowding each other's space. And some of us are so generous with words. And I told you, you need to be careful the words you throw around. Don't call a lady babe when there's nothing going on between the two of you. Babe, sweetie. Huh? You, you know, some of these things have a sensual effect upon the mind. When you're always just calling me at 10, it leaves me in a funny state. You get me? Why? You need to understand that those spaces are very important and that is why I say parental responsibility and support must always be there at the beginning. Apart from Abraham and Hagar and Rebecca, even King Saul approved of David's marriage to Michal. If you read that in 1 Samuel 18.20, you can read it so that we establish that. 1 Samuel 18 verses 20. Yes. I'd say and Michal, and Michal Saul's daughter and Michal Saul's daughter loved David loved David and they told Saul and they told Saul and the thing pleased him. Are you seeing that? Did they just elope? You're not answering me. Did they elope? What did they do? They told Saul. The family of the lady needs to know. The family of the man needs to know. And I want to tell you and dare you, if you're a Christian, and you're serious, by the way, the ladies who are here, relationships that begin like that will always end in a marriage. Rarely will there be something in between. Because you can never involve parents until you are serious. Amen? You heard me? Yeah, so if your courtship is, is only on WhatsApp and over the fence huh? and always hidden, you need to question the foundation behind which you're doing it. The second choice that we need to look at, the things that you must look into, number two, is put it to God in prayer. And I want this to really sink in your mind. Satan is in the business of uniting people who are unfit for each other. Mr. White says that that is his work every day. He does not want you to meet someone who is your match. He always wants to meet you to meet someone who will destroy your usefulness. And so because of this, courtship is a spiritual issue. You cannot enter into it just by human effort. You must commit it to prayer. And Sister White says, Adventist home, page 71, If men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day, before they contemplate marriage, they should pray four times a day when such a step is anticipated. Meaning at the time when you will now want to be doing this, we are told how many times should you pray? Four times a day. In fact, if you read Genesis 24, verse 12 to 14, we find Abraham's servant Eliezer 
prayed for God to help him that he may pick Rebecca. I want to assure you again, any desire to enter a relationship that fears God will never be entered without much prayer and soul searching. I know of people who commit time to fast and pray. They never enter that decision without seeking God. And one thing I will tell you, commit time to fasting and prayer. There are decisions that you are never to make in your own human mind. Allow God to guide you, else you will make mistakes that you cannot correct. So understand that it is a spiritual issue and God must be involved. And one thing I can guarantee you, you can never put anything to God in prayer. And then he lets you go deceived. Amen. God will never in any way disappoint you if you are serious about courtship and you want him to guide you. Because God knows who is your rib. Are we together? For the men who are here. God knows who your rib is. Amen. Yeah. He knows and this is the idea I usually get from many people who are rushing into courtship. And I ask myself, where is your faith? Huh? Where is your faith? We spoke about preciousness by faith. Didn't you? Let me tell you something. If a lady is for you, and you are waiting on the promises of God, regardless of where she goes, whether she goes to the USA and comes back, or she goes to India and comes back, or she goes where and comes back, if, you, if the person is for you, they'll always end up back to where you are. The lack of a man there just shows me how we lack faith. <laughs> that kind of reasoning totally perplexes me. Eti lazima ni mshikilie sahi fastia Walaza na chukuliwa na mtu mingine And the question, nani alikuambia yeye ndiye wako? You know we are living in a generation, we are always in a hurry We are always in a hurry hmm? And that is when we make a lot of the mistakes So get the point here very well Prayer makes it sure The person who is best suited for you Only God knows, amen When you commit yourself to God he will make sure that the right person comes to you at the right time. It must be an issue of faith. Trust in God. So the second thing I've said, put before God in prayer. And under that statement, you can make it very clear that God knows the right partner and the right time to have that partner. Do not at any point in your life think that you have to hold someone. Huh? There is a way we normally call employees who are to work for an organization only when the job is there. We normally say you put them on retainership. You've heard of it? If, if, if you do for me that job and I am supposed to pay you 70000 when that job is not there because you might go elsewhere, I pay you 20000 as retainership. You know what that means? So that in case that job comes back, you have to come back to me. You get the point? Retainership. I retain you. You are not working for me, but I'm giving you some stipend so that in case you are out there, you can do your stuff. But if I get another job, what happens? You come back, and if I say you come back, you come back. We are together. So there are some people here who put partners on retainership. <laughs> you get. They have an arranged courtship that does not have an agenda in the sense that when they are serious in the future they will become serious about it and I told you an agendaless courtship will always sink down to sex immorality and stupidity we are together even if you have all this up in your head the natural inclination between a man and a woman is always natural if there is no agenda of relationship and marriage at the end of the day, the devil will tempt you on that point that you are tempting him to tempt you on. And he will persistently tempt you on that point. That is a point you need to know. The other thing that you must understand is choose a matured partner 
I have been saying this again and again, and I'm repeating it. Choose a mature partner, and also a partner who is attractive to you, and who has a good character. Now, there are three points that I've covered there, and I want to mention them one by one. Now, Isaac and Rebecca were both matured when they were marrying, amen? I shared with you again, there are some instances where I can never even discuss courtship with, with, with a given age range. You are barely out of your teens, meaning your early twenties. Uh, you are now serious looking for a wife. And you are in your teens, or a husband. We cannot even trust you with your life yet. <laughs> you are still discovering yourself. How can you carry the burden of someone else's life? We are together. And I said maturity is not really age, by the way. There are some people who may be grown up, but they don't know what to do with 20,000. Or 30. If it lands in them, they are confused. They can spend it in one week. And you can't even tell where they've gone to. And I want to also add, the ability to say no to sex and some of these things also is maturity. You heard me. Only a mature man knows that your girlfriend is not the object of your lust. An immature man will be seeing a woman as an object of lust. Maturity spiritually and even in terms of how you've grown up is what will guide you. Ladies, when you stumble upon a man who is constantly seeking to take you to bed all the time from the time they met you, I can guarantee you that you have just come across immaturity at that point in your life. There is no amen. I will say amen for myself. Amen. Because <laughs> I know what I'm telling you is true. We are together. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, we need to know that Isaac and Rebecca were beautiful. When it comes to beauty, I'm normally very careful. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, they say. Beauty is not, is not something that all of us will appreciate together. We are together. My wife may not be beautiful to you, but trust me, she is to me. Amen? Amen. Yeah, she's the most beautiful woman. And that will always remain in my head because that is how I must view her if she's to be my wife. God is good. At the same time, you need to understand that your partner must be attractive to you. As much as we speak of the spiritual, we cannot dismiss the natural attraction. We are together. You cannot marry someone out of sympathy. And this is serious, you can't. It is actually sin to marry someone you don't love. You get the point? The attraction must be where? Must be there because it will help you fulfill 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We are together. These are very biblical things we are looking at. The Bible says that the body of the woman belongs to the husband and the husband's body belongs to the woman. And they are supposed to always be together unless they give consent to fast and pray. But once they are done fasting and praying, they are to come together again that Satan does not deceive them. So if that is the case then, we say physical attraction is important. Amen? Yeah, the kind of person you are getting yourself to must not just be mature but attractive to you. Meaning they are desirable. We are not saying that you lust after them. But we are saying they are desirable. They are good to look at. They have some aesthetic value to you. You get the point? Because one thing I can guarantee you, when you tell your wife she's beautiful and you don't see her so, you are a liar. You must see it to say it. Amen? I don't know if you are getting me. Yeah, I'm teaching very practical things here and I want you to <laughs> appreciate that they are very practical. Another thing also under that is I said, choose a matured partner, also a partner who is attractive to you and has a good character. 
Rebecca also was of a good character. That is Genesis 24 verse 18 to 20. She was a virgin. That is one. And she also was sympathized with, with, with Eliezer. Now can I tell you why we say Rebecca was of a good character? Sister White says that watch every development of character in the partner that you want to choose. She says watch every development of character. And she says you can bear with their weaknesses but never with their vices. Amen? With their weaknesses but never with their vices. Now, how can I make this clearer to us? When Eliezer went to that well, that well had so many people coming to draw water. And Eliezer said a prayer that the one who will feed his camels and give them sufficient water is the one that he will do it will be the one for the master. Now when he prayed this prayer, Rebecca had never met Eliezer. But out of this request, do you know Rebecca made sure that all the camels were fed? And uh, one author writes that the amount of water needed was 70,000 liters. And Rebecca did this work without any motivation. Because I believe Eliezer did not stand there and say, Go on, go on. You, are, you might win this case. Continue. He was not doing that. I tend to believe that he was just watching. Ana Peter, ata ya ana shanga, ana rudi. Ana Peter, ana rudi. Until Ali, Ali wapea maji wote. Can you imagine the sacrifice? And she was doing this to a stranger. Na kawapea maji wote, then after that, akapeleka Eliezer kwao. Are you seeing that good character was intentionally spotted? And the sign Eliezer wanted was that of good character. And let me tell you something, of all the things you will look at in a person, character stands to be the most valued. Above education, above money, above looks, above everything else, the character of your partner will determine the peace you have in the home. Amen? That is why you need to know someone's character. So that when you are married to them, you know. There are some people whom when you get married to, they will go silent on you for one month. You need to know if they can go silent. We are together. <laughs> there are others who most likely will beat you. You need to know their violence before. There are others who may turn out to be drunkards. Mr. White says even if he takes a glass of wine, that is sufficient reason. That is what? <laughs> sufficient reason. Because he will be a drunkard in your relationship. Rebecca had a good character. And God wants us to follow that example. In fact, Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 5.11. Can you read that? 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. So that we move fast. 1 Corinthians 5.11, my reader. 5.11 of 1 Corinthians. It says, But now I have written unto you, uh -huh. not to keep company, uh -huh. if any man that is called a brother, uh -huh. be a fornicator, be a fornicator, or a or covetous, or covetous, or an idolater, or an idolater, or a railer, uh -huh. or a drunkard, or a drunkard, or an exhaustioner, uh -huh. with such as with such an one, not a no not to eat. You are not to keep company with people who have those things. Now I would be very careful not to keep company with someone whom I know is cherishing a non sin advice that is detrimental to the two of us. It either has to stop or that relationship will be detrimental. I told you again and again, God can never bless you in disobedience. Are we together? He can never bless you where? In disobedience. So those are very important points. That is why I shared with you and I will be sharing this the whole week. Any relationship that you may be in, even at this moment, and the sustaining fuel of that courtship is immorality, or is wealth, or is gossip, or is some kind of sin, then that relationship ought not to exist, regardless of how you may rationalize it. You heard me. You know they can rationalize. 
mwangania na kuanga mpole sa zingine Asa nikimwacha si hata hata umia You know some of the things we sit down and rationalize Eh huh? hata kama kujangi charge Eh huh? nikitanganga kitu ananunulia And I ask myself with all the present truth that we have as a church those are your reasons Huh? University will do it. We can do better than that. Amen. Amen. We can do better than that. Now this one more point is an interesting one. Find a partner who is not lazy. Now I want to tell you the truth because I'm married. One of the greatest problems you will have in marriage if you don't understand is laziness marriage can never exist between two lazy people you heard me lazy yeah lazy ni ile washing guo you're too lazy to cook you're too lazy to bring food to the table if you look at the bible what was the sign that God gave Eliezer? Rebecca was was hard working. Rebecca was hard working and she drew water. Then Jacob worked for 7 years. Then because she was given the wrong one, he worked for 7 more years and he was given the right one. But ideally, he stayed with both the point we need to understand by the way it should be important that you understand also as a man this is important that paying dowry is part of a showcase of your hard work and your commitment amen you heard me yeah don't be serious with the bible but you're not serious about the dowry and your commitment I tell no people, but there is no sin in paying dowry. You are not buying your wife. Dowry is not purchase of the. You cannot purchase your wife. She is not worth the amount you are going to pay for the dowry. But it's a showcase to the parents, a demonstration that you are hardworking. You can sustain that woman, and you can keep that woman. And under your household, she will always be able to have sufficient for herself for the respect that you will have as a man and that of your family you need to copy Jacob's example and that will also consist in the home I've read so many books on marriages one of the key things that destroys homes is laziness I think I was sharing was it with the I don't know if it was who in the morning and I was telling him that I believe with all my heart that Christianity does not entertain laziness and indiscipline. Was it at the table? I'm not sure where we were taking lunch. It was there, isn't it? You cannot be a lazy Christian. The grace of God upon your heart will compel you to action. And this laziness is one of the key areas that will sustain the home in terms of finance and other things. We need to know that the family needs clothing, shelter, food for the children and for everyone. Because of this, it is important that you have a partner who is not lazy. Because of the interest of time, I have not covered all of them. But are we headed somewhere? I want to answer a burning question. One, then I just three. Give him the mic so that he asks that question. I will complete the others tomorrow. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Yes, uh, yesterday we studied about uh, uh, the equality between man and the woman before the fall. Of, uh, before the fall. We say that. Uh, 
since uh, the fall of man, the man and woman could not live in equality. So one could, could submit to the other. In that case, the woman to the man. And now, as we have been studying, we, we are aiming to get back to Eden. And in Eden, we will we'll regain that equality. So will it be logic to say that we should start practicing that equality now? That is one of the most subtle questions I've had in a long time. <laughs> we need to understand something very clear here. Perhaps I'll bring the quotation later. We said, as long as we are in this world of sin, the happiness in the marriage will only exist when one submits to the other. In heaven, we are told there will be no marriages. We are together. So you know that. So even as, as much as we talk about restoration, we are not talking about holy flesh. You know what holy flesh is? You've heard of holy flesh. Holy flesh is the idea that by God saving us, then he changes our carnal nature and our body to the perfection Adam and Eve had. The perfection we are always discussing about is that of character. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But the interesting thing in the Bible is that Christ in a woman makes her submissive to the husband. Christ in the husband makes him honor the wife and at the same time offer himself for the love he has for the family. A man who is like Jesus will die for the sake of his children and wife. He will put himself in the fire like Jesus did, that they may be protected. But a woman who is in Christ will submit. The best text you can find to support this is in the book of uh, Peter. And I like how Peter brings it out. Peter understands this, 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 this concept very well. And he wants us to be able to understand it. First Peter, I'm reading 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. And it says... Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, the point Peter is bringing here is, even if your husband is an unbeliever and he does not believe in the things you are to do, the woman is not to usurp the rulership or the leadership of the man but she is to be in subjection even in that state. In subjection to a leadership that is not perfect. You heard me. God is not telling us that the woman is only to be in subjection to the husband in a perfect marriage, but even in an imperfect marriage. And we are told that by the conduct of the woman, the man may be warned. Then he says in verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair, or wearing of gold, or putting on the apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in the which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and what? Quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of a great price. Then he says, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women of also who trusted in who? God adorned themselves, being in subjection to who? To their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. Now the point you need to know is this. Jesus will never make the woman arise or go beyond the relation given in marriage. The Bible does not say that the woman is to submit to every man she meets. But within the circle of the home, for the home to be a home, the man is given leadership. By the way, if you didn't know, you need to understand that the greatest need of a man in a home is honor and respect. It is not that he is seeking it. God has given this leadership upon him. He must be the priest of that home. And if the same spirit of God is in the woman, the woman will show honor and respect. And there is a way we normally teach it in family life. We say, the woman is not honoring the man because he deserves it. In our fallen nature, we will always have mistakes. Are we together? 
your husband may be forgetful you get me your husband may sometimes not remember your things you want him to remember <laughs> but the bible will portray that the spirit filled woman will always submit to this leadership let me give you an example in organization how do you approach your boss when you don't agree or he has made a mistake do you go and tell him oh uh talk about kwa nini una something like that what do you do you disagree but in subjection you get the point now we are having women liberation we are having these things of women rights and others anything that is trying to uplift the woman to feel that in the marriage relationship she can't have the place of the man or in any way she can rise above the man will never bring her peace and happiness in the home because it is unnatural for a woman in the home to assume leadership because i shared with you what is the greatest need of a woman security she submits to security if the husband provides financial security she submits to it protection the submission to it the point we need to understand is the marriage was reorganized the only way happiness can be in the home is when the man understands he is a leader not arbitrary leadership is not dictatorship you need to understand that leadership does not mean now the man is oh do this or else do this i am the leader do this i am the man no it means that the leadership the man is to employ is similar to that which we see jesus in the church it is a leadership by persuasion a leadership by mutual submission and in fact someone once said that indeed a good man will do nothing without consulting the wife it is not a leadership where you do that so i'm not teaching we, we are not teaching women liberation movement or we are not teaching that the woman is to have what we are now calling today gender equality it can be everywhere but within the marriage there is a need that one submits to the other and that is why the language of the bible husbands love your wives wives the holy women of all what did they do they submitted and they, they she even called the husband lord you get the point yeah but today we are in a complex society society of slave queens and let me tell you something slave queen cannot work in marriage you had me it cannot work in marriage because if you if you if you are a slave queen then you should remain single because within the family and the objectives of the home you will not enjoy peace and happiness i want to end at that point but i have answered you we will continue tomorrow for the interest of time let us just bow our heads so that we pray as we end this session Heavenly Father we thank you for what we've learned in this family life as we continue to practice and understand this vital truth may your presence abide with us helping us choose wisely i know that young people here some of them may have made wrong decisions give them the power and the courage to break off from what they need to break off from to actually reform in where they need to reform to surrender into your hands the future that they do not see now and to trust that God you are willing to give them right partners at the right time that they may settle in the confidence that you are guiding them even as you guide them in other areas of their lives a lot of other preachers are coming after me put your words in their mouth and use them for this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ the lord bless you